o'clock. He's part of music history as the former frontman and lyricist of the Sex Pistols, but as Johnny Rotten gave way to John Lydon, how much has the man himself mellowed? over the years. He's just released a document of his incredible life so far, which he describes as the life of a serious risk taker. John Lydon, author of Anger is an Enemy, My Life Uncensored. Welcome to Five Live, an afternoon Hello. Edition. Hello. I'm best John. known by proper music lovers as the front man of Public Image Limited. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Uh, understandable. Of that. Um, we we <laughs> talked about the, the title of the book, Anger is an Energy. Are, are you still angry today? Are you as angry as you were? Do you still get angry at the same things? Well, if, if something's there to irritate the hell out of me and suppress me, of course I'm going to be angry. I'm never going to resort to violence. I'm going to use the energy therein. Describe how now, that anger works. anger is an energy. Let me explain what that, that, that phrase comes from. Some people say anger, from. anger saps you of energy. No. And try not to interrupt, and we'll get somewhere. Okay, well, we'll, we'll have a lot quicker. <laughs> right, we'll, there is, there is <laughs> three of us, though, John. It will happen. an example of anger and energy. <laughs> no, it is. Uh, when I was young, I had a serious disease, which has uh, almost took my life, called meningitis. And uh, the result of that was uh, a year in hospital. But uh, when I came out of the coma, I lost my memory. Uh, I didn't remember anybody or anything. Including your parents? Including my parents, and, and even more so my own name. Uh, I couldn't speak properly. I was deeply frustrated. I couldn't communicate with anyone. But I didn't recognise anybody. And uh, years later, my mum and dad, they told me uh, that the hospital recommended me, took me home at eight. Uh, it was going to be difficult to deal with me, but to keep me angry. And, and that would somehow help me much much harder i know it seems harsh but mm. it did it helped me remember it How took four years e everything all the details properly they, they do return yeah. you know they are stored up there they don't yeah. just vanish how did your parents keep you angry uh, not giving in to whims or tantrums uh, uh not molly coddling me and uh absolutely uh, uh, making it clear that self-pity wouldn't work and that helped me not become a, an institutionalized dummy dum dum even though when i went back to school that's what even the teachers called me but then as a result of that though were you sort of always on the periphery of of things a little bit well you feel kind of isolated it's very hard to fit back in and you don't recognize anyone in in in, in the school or and you, you just it's a mystery you know and you do you depend really heavily on um the word that people tell you to be the whole truth and nothing but if they tell you you belong here, you have to believe that. Um, of course, I mean, there were many lies told to me, and I've never forgot them adults. But I guess you know, you, And this is why, to this day, I, I, I do not tolerate people lying to me. I, I, guess I count very, very heavily on the truth. I'm interested in, the, in whether or not your childhood and having meningitis and being in the coma and the way it was for you at school... Is that actually what's what's made you really angry? Because you feel like an outsider? No, but it definitely fuels some energy there. Um, it took a long time for me to uh, get back to where I was. I mean, at four... Do you like people, can I just ask Yeah, you? oh, very much. I'm very social. <laughs> but at, at four... As long as they don't interrupt you. At four years old, <laughs> I could read and write. And uh, I managed to get that all back, and then tenfold. I mean, you know... I'm well self-educated, me. Mm. Uh, libraries, absolutely essential part of, of that, that learning process. And so kind of w well crafted, really, and mentally prepared for something as daft as the Sex Pistols. Because I think when, when people meet you for the first time, they have, a, they have an idea of, of what you will be like. And yeah. I, I wonder whether in writing this book, are you trying to paint a picture of... of of the truth or are you oh yeah no yeah. it's not paint yet no I, I want you to completely clearly understand what it is i came from that made me what i am and what i'm going to continue to be it's um it's unfortunate that you know when you you join a, a pop band and it, it achieves some sense of fame that people tend to categorize you as never existing before that day they first heard about you and where, how did you make that move then from angry teenager who, who as you described been been through that that coma very early in life into the sex pistols what was the what was, yeah, the, what was I, the mental I know, move i know you, yeah, but you're implying that i just walk around angry all the no, time no, no, i'm very, I'm very no, well, far from that i'm, just, I'm trying to get, get into why you know i, I know obviously it's, it's the lyrics to to one of your songs anger is is an energy but you know 
you talk about yourself in the book on the back back page it talks about you quite clearly as a as a risk taker mm. and i just wondered that 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 whole anger element if you were to ask somebody who watched you in the 70s saw your music saw the way that you acted they would say that that, that is a big part of of who you are so i'm just trying to find oh, it's out. definitely a, yeah, uh, yeah. So i'm trying it's to see a very interesting side of me but how did you get from teenager to, to sex pistols man uh, with great difficulty and many jobs have been thrown out of schools and uh, I then worked on building sites to raise the money conti to continue my education. Uh, I love learning, I love observing, etc, uh, etc. Et uh, the more words I have in my vocabulary, the better I will be as a human being, I think. And, and I could never ever like a uh, lose the energy to want to absorb. I'm a bit like a sponge, you know, like a, a very a two-year-old, how they want to just take everything in. What's that? What's that, right? Tell that kid what that is, right? And it's the same with poor old Johnny here. What's that? Please do tell. Can I ask you about the actual, the, something to do with the book itself? I wonder whether you had a bit of a battle with the publishers in terms of the way that it's written because it's very conversational and you can when you read the book you can hear you, were you through the words. Yeah, were you, no, not censored. Is that but, something you were but, adamant but, about? But that could have been a possibility and we managed to work out that situation amongst ourselves. Of course it you know, they wanted to trans they wanted to transfer it into the Queen's English. Well, hello, I'm John. <laughs> You know, this is the way I talk, this you, is the way I think. You bring up the Queen there, which nicely segues into my next question. You would talk Ooh, about... She's lovely. <laughs> you talk about, in your book and in your music, of course, uh, your feelings about the royal family and mm. about your allegiance is something that has to be earned. Yeah. I'm not cannon fodder for anybody. I'll, I'll fight for a good cause, and if you, if you prove to me that you're righteous enough, oh, oh, I'll be there forever, to the bitter, bitter end. What, what would have the royal family, the to me, are, they, they seem like fairly decent human beings, mm -hmm. some of them really more than others, should we say, but that's, the, that's par for the course of being a, a Just, human. Um, I don't like the institution. I don't like the fact that it obligates me to support something that I see as a financial drain in, in this country. Can we really afford that kind of stuff anymore? It's nice to have a bit of pageantry. Uh, People that do support expensive. it. It's expensive. And for me, they're born into this thing that they can't really escape from. I, I, I feel kind of sorry for them. They're like uh, budgies or hamsters, you know, and they're only given one wheel to turn on. Poor things. What about people? My heart goes out to them in a way. People that are uh, very, very supportive of the monarchy, would you say that they're being good loyal to them? They yeah. can pay for it, but don't ask me. <laughs> but would you see that as blind loyalty? No, I think it's it's a desperation tactic, really. You, you're trying to cling to something there that you think will give some kind of substance and meaning to your life, when really uh, substance and meaning is found in your. Uh, your sense of obligation to your fellow human beings first you and love foremost being British, and not you? the institutions they're in but isn't that a british institution on you love being british is that not fair to no say? no i don't love the idea of being british i carry three passports one british one, one irish. irish and one american and you live in california now is that yeah right? yeah yeah i'm not particularly british i have a britishness that i'll, I'll never lose respect for I, I belong here but i belong elsewhere also do you get annoyed in America? Oh, there's plenty going on there to have to a go <laughs> It's a I whole don't new know. agenda. I don't exactly. But I like Americans as human beings. I like the population very, very much. What do you like about them? Can do actually. Open minded. Open minded. Very outdoorsy, sporty, generous to a fault. How do you think? And, and very, very, very uh, friendly. How do you think the Sex Pistols would have gone down in America had that all happened there rather than here? Well, that'd be very strange because I don't think anybody would have quite understood. <laughs> and, and indeed, the first time we went to America, that first uh, Sex Pistols tour, it was you know, what's all that about? <laughs> Tell me about the first... I mean, and, then, and the gigs we booked, I mean, we, we didn't go, uh, you know, the north, we, we, we did the deep south mm. and played uh, country western bars and clubs and, and auditoriums. <laughs> uh, you know, it went rather well. Tell us about the, the band, Johnny, and tell me about the first time that you met Sid. 
Oh, Sid, I've known as, um, again, uh, we both got kicked out of schools that we were in, and because we were under under the age, we then had to go to what was uh, known as a day-approved school situation. Uh, and we got on with each other. We were both, like, uh, very different. Uh, Sid was a, a very friendly, funny, uh, cynical kind of chappy. We meant well, but, oh, he'd love to skewer with parody anything that was different around him. How did you get on with the rest of the band members? What was the relationship like? Can you, can you take oh, us inside well, they, the band? they came in with the manager. I mean, they invited me in, into the band. So, see, see I, I brought in a year later. Uh, um, very, very difficult. They already had their clique running, but what they didn't have was a songwriter and a, a, a proper front man and an image and an attitude and, and a direction. Everything that you need to be abandoned is what <laughs> and, you're saying. you know, hello, I just had the audacity to supply all those things. And, you know, here we are years later and there's still people out there claiming credit for those things that all come from me. And it's unfortunate it puts me in a position of having to defend myself. I, I don't feel I need to do that. I think the proof's in the pudding. When you were writing your songs... Where does the inspiration, for the most part, come about? Experience. Life's experiences. Absolutely. So... This is, this is my life story. Every, every song I've ever written is, is a different aspect of, of what I endure. And the atmosphere around you at the time, describe that. Describe what it was like living in the punk era. Well, I mean, we had the riot, the, the, the strikes, the riots, there was garbage everywhere, the country was in a state of chaos, uh, and there was me merrily exploding into reality about all of this. I had a few words to say about what the situation was really about. This is my early Pistol songs. I wouldn't say they were uh, especially political, they were more aimed at institutions that were completely dismantling this this Britain that we know and and needed a serious kicking and I, and I delivered that and, and not using violence uh, I use words words are my bullets and I think they hurt more and they create more it did affect change it seriously did was it the plan from day one to be anarchic did it, did it feel like that when you when no you i don't started? think i've ever been anarchic i've always seen, seen anarchy as mind games for the middle class right i i used the term because it, it got me to where i needed to be in the song it was it was essential what in terms anarchy of, in terms is, of anarchy has the, the potential for change but it it exists purely in a situation that it can't live without so it's fighting against change itself it's like uh devil worshipping you really have to then accept there is a god so therefore your satanism is a rather foolish move isn't it because you've gone for the lesser option what do you say to people that say the whole thing was a big act that actually you weren't from a particularly tough background you didn't experience <laughs> particularly tough times and yet there you are trying to take down the institutions <laughs> how on earth would i have managed such a wonderful scenario can you imagine the millions and millions and millions of pounds it would require to fake all of that when really all you've got to do is open your eyes and go there it is the boy's telling it like it is and that is a fact but johnny rosson and john lyden you make the distinction between the two correct Johnny Rotten's a nickname that turned out to be a really good nickname, and it was based on a, you know, the quality of my teeth at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but is there a difference between those two men? He's a bold, saucy side of me, but there's other aspects in my personality that I need to explore. And uh, when the pistols imploded or exploded, depending on your point of view, uh, I, I went on to form public image and uh, explored, uh, I think, a far more serious terrain, inner turmoil, um, and dealing with, with true emotions and, and questioning myself whether I'm right or wrong here. And, you know, I had to analyse what, what my pistol's experience was, and I wasn't going to throw that away. I needed, I needed to really analyse it seriously, and I did that through the vehicle of Public Image Limited. And what did that analysis bring you to? Wonderful work, accuracy... Uh, I think it's made me a, 
a nicer person, if that's possible. Okay. Uh, a more accurate person, and it's not just uh, uh, a quick shot violent response or mental confusion about a thing, I now know what answers are and I'm always consistently seeking an upgrade on those things. So do, do you look, but with that in mind then, that you, you feel you're a, a nicer person in a, in a better place, do you look back with any regret or do you, do you I'm just... I'm lying that? about the nice bit, <laughs> I just realised in my head, because to be called nice is the worst thing on God's earth, isn't it? <laughs> Is there any regret as you look Is there, back? What's wrong with being nice? Well, I'm analysing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but when you finish that, we'll ask you another one. Days of Sydney. I, I'm very, very, I'm open. Yes. Uh, but I get hurt because of that, because I believe what people tell me, and then I become a victim to, to a lie. And, and that's, that's something that uh, I'm aware of all the time, but I don't really think I should stop being what I am in that respect, to, to stay open-minded, regardless of the consequences. I think people saw but when that. But when I can see an obvious lie coming, oh, you know, hello. I agree. You know, I've, I've, I've got the vocabulary there to snap on that. I think people saw the sensitivity in you uh, when you did I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Would you say that that exposed parts of you that you felt uncomfortable about or are you very happy with the experience? No, I'm very happy to tell it like it is. It's just, if I feel it like uh, that I need to be accurate about certain aspects of my life and there's an audience there, well, that's, hello, audience, you want to welcome. Why did because you that, do that, it? That, that world, we go, oh, I did a celebrity for charity. Right. Yeah, but it's just all the money went to charities. That's what I did it for. Did even, though it? I, even though I was accused of trying to, you know, what? Resurrect a career, or <laughs> this is so ludicrous. Did you watch I can think it of better afterwards. ways of resurrecting a career than camping it rough <laughs> with B class celebrities eating kangaroos? <laughs> exactly, bits and bobs. Listen, there, there, there was some, there, there's, that's that's fairly real there outside the camp. There really are some like dangerous insects and, and snakes and lizards and things, and, and I really found that thrilling and enjoyable and i would i'd meander off and found that nature liked me and i liked nature so i got an awful lot out of it and from that put an awful lot of money into charities can i we're going to go to do some news and sport in a minute john but before you go um before we go and you're going to stay around till three o'clock and take some of our listeners questions as well we've got lots more we'd like to talk to you about oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's all right <laughs> on, on the <laughs> It'll be over soon. Don't worry. <laughs> on, on the subject of on the subject of lying, and you say that that's that's something that you really don't yeah. like. Can you tell when someone is is lying to you? What are your are you got tell well, tell signs? You, know, you know, it, it depends on, on what information you have around that situation. Okay. Sometimes not at all. Uh, um, I don't know if you can detect a lie in people's eyes. I mean, that's that's what some people say. Maybe then I should stare at you all more often. <laughs> I think you're doing quite <laughs> enough of that as it is. Thanks very much. But then, listen, we all get caught out, and it does, it hurts. A lie hurts. So mm -hmm. why, why do you want to do that to another person, really? Do we need it anymore? You no, know, we're looking at the 21st century here. As a species, where, where are we going with this? And on that, you know, I want to get notes. back into the Garden of Eden. John Lighton is with us on Afternoon <laughs> What a great edition. out that is from an interview. 85058 is our text number. If you would like to send some uh, questions for us to ask John, we'd really love that. Afternoon edition at bbc.co.uk is our email address. Let's get the news now. What's stopping you forming Shots another bath? Here is the news. <laughs> on digital, online... You're listening to Afternoon Edition on Five Live with Sarah Brett and Dan Walker and delighted to say that John Lydon is still here with us. Had a little break because the studio, John, is incredibly hot, isn't it? Hey, <laughs> toasty. <laughs> uh, we've got loads of questions which we've been getting from uh, listeners for you, John. Uh, keep sending them in, 85058, Afternoon Edition at bbc.co.uk or you can get us on Twitter as well, at BBC Five Live. Uh, Liam would like to know, Liam's in Mirfield, he says... Uh, for a band that was espousing anarchy, you were seriously talented. The sound was tight, disciplined, incredible guitar lines. The vocal was a bit mad, he says at times, but you must have practiced massively. Otherwise, you're simply not human. In other words, his point is, a little unanarchy like maybe you practiced too much. Oh, what a silly sausage. Of course we're going to be as excellently uh, precise as we can be. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not going to drive a truck on three wheels, am I? <laughs> Uh, and do you I think that answers that. OK, that's that one. Uh, John would like to know, do you get to see Arsenal much these days? Uh, I don't like that modern theatre. 
I think that says it all. Okay, let's end that. I like a short answer every now and again. Okay, Paul in Suffolk would like to know, do you regret some of your lyrics, like God Bless Ian Brady or God Bless Myra Hindley? It's from Paul in Suffolk. Ah, that's, those are not my lyrics. Okay. That, that's, that's rock and roll swindle nonsense. So you nothing to do with that? No, nothing to do with that at all. And that's, that's the difference okay. between, you know, when Mr. Rotman's no longer in the pistols, that was the cheap hit second-hand nonsense that they were presenting. Uh, one more, and I think this might be slightly um, off the wall. Are no, there I think this is true. Are there any truth in the rumours that you'll be touring with Miley Cyrus next year? That's true, isn't it, John? <laughs> <laughs> you can't wait. Well, well she's wearing well. my hair, do. I might as well have a go at it. Exactly right. <laughs> I want to... I like her legs, I've got to say. She's got a lovely pair of legs, it has to be said. Hello. <laughs> Let me ask you something a little bit more. Going back in time again, I wanted you to tell us a little bit of a, a story about being the Sex Pistols and what happened when Sid Vicious died. Because when you talk about it in the book, it's, it's really touching, actually. You say, figure it, seriously, you're over your head, I warned you. And you say Sydney wasn't a smart fellow. You warned him time and time again. Yeah. Don't get in over your head. Yeah. Well, he, he, he wasn't the brightest spark on the planet, Sid. Uh, he was my friend, and uh, and I miss him very much, I've got to tell you. But, and I felt really guilty about bringing him into the pistols because he, he was ill-equipped mentally to deal with the pressures. And... Uh, and he was prone to fall into the drug culture very quickly because his mother was a registered heroin addict and you know and there'd been situations before the pistols when I, i'd seen her give him a, a birthday present of a bag of, of heroin i did not like this and he, he always said no i'll never be like that but from the first moment he joined the band he became very much like that the trouble with heroin as a drug what it does is it it hides the inadequacies and self-doubts you have, and Sydney had a lot of them. But what he didn't understand was we all had them too, but we had already been at it for, you know, nearly a year here, and so we were better prepared, and uh, he just wouldn't listen. He just would not listen. He took that easy way out, and the result always with that is going to be a tragic death, a loss. The situation he got in became a, a very low-rent melodrama. Remind us of that situation. Remind us what happened around that Girlfriend time. Girlfriend stabbed. Mystery as to who did. Sid in jail. Uh, gets out, meets his mum, and dies of an overdose. I mean, how strange. What a series of coincidences. How often did you and, see And him? all manner of intrigue. I've got to tell you, around that mm. time of people like saying, uh, oh, it was a, a drug gang murder and, and whatever. It's, you know how people love to add a mystery to what, what is basic, like the common sense of this is he created the situation himself and he willingly walked into it and thought he could handle it. But really, secretly, deep down inside, I think he knew he couldn't. How often did you see him at that time? Very little. It was, it was just maybe the odd phone call, and um, and then there'd be a resentment from him because he, he didn't want to hear what I had to say. So almost from the moment you introduced him to the band, you you saw that yeah. spiral happening, oh, and that's why yeah. you describe yeah, it as yeah, a bit yeah. of guilt. All the hangers on, you know, the cottage industry of liggers that you get being in a band, zoomed in on him and told him how wonderful he is and all of this, and he he just totally got sucked up into it. I tell you, fame is a, is a it's a monster, a monster, and none of us were given any warning or help. You know, it's, it's, it's lucky that we survived ourselves. I want to ask you what kept you grounded in a little while, but I, to ask you just again about Sid, you said you felt very bad about it, you wrote songs about it afterwards yeah. for a while. Do you think, and do you wonder still now, if there's anything that you could have said to him or you could have done that would have stopped yeah, him? Yeah, hindsight does me no good, though, does it? This is this is it, the thing, you know, probably would have been. Uh, if I was if I was smart now, as I, as I could have been then, maybe so. And that, and that's that's the tragedy of it. You know, the longer you live, you know, you learn more, and you and you see like the error of some kind of aspects of yourself when you were younger. 
Uh, but I don't want to punish myself too much on it because he, the ultimate responsibility of that situation belongs entirely to Sid because it's his life and he chose to live it that way. And uh, I have to sadly then say I had to be an observer of watching the bus go over the cliff mm. slowly and deliberately. It must be very hard to, to see somebody who you, you oh, clearly had time for oh, it go hurts, like that. Yeah, it hurts like mad. Hurts like mad. But uh, I'm like this about every stupid, silly rock deaf. Every single one of them that lead themselves down that, that ridiculous path. And Who else are you thinking about? Well, there's the Primal Scream fella recently. I mean, there's endless deaths in, in, in music industry. Why didn't it happen and I, to I, you? I, and let me say, I don't want to ban drugs. What I want is free information available to the public on every single aspect of what drug taking is and then make healthier decisions about what it is you indulge in. Would that make any difference to rock stars, though, who get involved in that lifestyle? As you say, people no, throw yeah, themselves no, ignorant, yeah, Well, he, he, it's, it's a premise of mine, but I don't think ignorance is bliss. And uh, if you educate yourself, then you're better armed against uh, the calamities that can unfold. Now, some people are just naturally suicidal, um, and whether it be heroin or a tablespoon of salt, they're going to find a way to do it. How can it's you... difficult. Uh, what, what can I do here but just give advice? Mm -hmm. How come you never went down that road or that you didn't succumb or become as influenced perhaps as other people that you knew? Ah, right. Well, no. I have had situations where I've overindulged. Uh, I pull away from the edge. I don't want to ever wallow in the dark side. You love life? Yeah, I do. I absolutely do. And I love human beings. And I love the company of my fellow human beings. I love to hear children make noise on an aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't many people like that, John. What an absolutely brilliant thing to say. You're one of the only people in the world. Although, funny, because I've just had a baby and now I, uh, I often you... think to myself, why did I get so angry before? Because I'm now that yeah. woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just full of the joy of life. That, that's the future. You know, more power to them. Squeal away, piglets. <laughs> John, when you say stuff like that, do you... Because there is, there is, we talked about it a little bit earlier on, there is that mythology around you as an individual and around mm. the band as well, as was. Do you, do you feel that, that people automatically misjudge you and expect uh, you to be I in just, a certain yeah, way? I mean, I could go into it really seriously and, and uh, I'm very suspicious about the motives of some of the journalists when I first started, what, what their ambitions were and, and negativity seemed to be the driving force, consistently looking for something bad to sell copy. But you were rubbing everybody up the wrong way, so oh, yeah, because that's understandable. I'm John, no surrender. And, 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 well. and, and, and you come at me that way, well, the, the sharper I'm going to make my tools. Because I, I, I don't believe in compromise. I don't see anything that I've done being wrong, corrupt. I've not lied to anyone. I try to do my best for all. Uh, any band I'm in, I insist it's equal pay, equal everything. I, I don't want this hierarchy system. Well, that's interesting. Is that because of your uh, relationship with Malcolm McLaren? No, I never had a relationship with Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell and, me. And if you read Vivian Westwood's book, neither did she. <laughs> <laughs> Easy now. Let's talk about that though, and, and Malcolm's influence on the band. There wasn't one. Um, he was the manager though. Yeah, and he booked really, really bad gigs and, and, and created all manner of turmoil and, and subterfuge. And, and, of course, like, uh, he, he pandered to... Uh, this was the beginning of paparazzi time, when scandal mongering and, you know, the, the Rupert Murdoch empire was taking over. And, and we had to endure a lot of that nonsense and, and survive through it. Uh, Malcolm enjoyed that because he didn't have to actually experience what that could result in. The violence turned in on against us. He was in the safety of his, his you know, enclave mm. while we were out there having to deal with it in, in real life. Uh, I gave them everything and they gave me nothing, not even respect, and that that be the truth of it. And so... There you go. Say la vie, Sex Pistols. I've had me fill here. You know, life's got to get better than that. Peace.
How much do you think... And if you push it too far, <laughs> pieces. <laughs> Do you think that Malcolm <laughs> McLaren had the top gag? I quite like that. <laughs> I'm just, writing, I'm just writing that down for future use. <laughs> Do you think he did at any point have the? He never. He, nev the he never offers any heart? protection from his position as an adult. We were very young kids, exposed to some serious dangers, and he just keeps stirring the pot. But he never contributed or, to anything like a direction or, or guidelines or or protection. No, not even places to live. We'd have to be squatting and find things for ourselves. We'd have, I'd have to, like, for instance, I mean, I bunked so many times on the underground, I mean, just, I, I wore out a well-beaten path, mm. but, I, but I didn't have the money. And if I was pulled at that time, oh, I know, that would be jail, you know. I'm not Tony Blair's wife. There's, a, there's an awful lot we'd love to talk to you about. We've got about ten minutes left. There's a few items in the, in the book I'd just like to, to bring up and, and, and get you to say a little bit more about them. One is a gig you did at Chelmsford, Chelmsford Maximum Security ah. Prison. How did that come about and what was it like? <laughs> Sounds like a great gig. <laughs> Best drugs I ever had. <laughs> it, was, it was quite mental. I mean, it's maximum security, so, you know, you don't know what you're walking into here, but... You know, the chaps locked up there were, we were well and truly grateful that somebody bothered to come and, like, you know, help them out a bit and offer them something to break the monotony and, and the spiteful evilness, I think, of the jail system anyway. You're not, you're not helped out of the position that you've got yourself into. There's no, there's no information being here. It's all about cruelty and locking people away and, and, and being spiteful to them. I don't what think, should happen I to them? I don't think putting anyone in an iron box and turning the key is going to solve an inner turmoil. What There's if a some... mental anxiety there. Study it and learn by that so that that isn't becoming an endless pattern. Sure, but you could perhaps understand... But in the meantime, if it's a child molester, do what you want with them. Well, this is it. What if it happens to somebody, you you, you lose somebody close to you, to somebody should... Oh, I, say, have done. So, I have done. So, to, to, as the fault of somebody else? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm talking here like a, in an openly pleasant way, and I realise that there's some people that just really do deserve to be institutionalised. Okay. I'm well aware of that, but... but but overall, the prison but system... I, I would think that that would be a very minimal amount. Maybe, you know, there's that 1% in everything, including prison population, that just are too utterly evil to endure. Mm. Other than that, what a great gig. I mean, everybody's, you know, so open. And of course I make light of the uh, drugs reference, but I mean, these blokes have got nothing. And they're offering you a roll-up out of an old tin. You know, that, that's like... Uh, a, a week's earnings for them, just that, that one cigarette. I mean, that means heaps to me. We go from the rights and wrongs of the prison system to status quo, because you quite like them, surprisingly. Yo, how, how could anyone not like the most perfect ribbon section in the world? <laughs> it's really simple, but by God, their live gigs were fun. Uh, absolute fun. I really, really liked what they came up with, uh, I, and I still do to this day. I know you want to talk a little bit about Public Image Limited, um, and tell tell us a little bit about why the song Rise means so much to you, because that is what the title of the book the t it comes from. It's a lyric from Rise, Anger is an Energy, one of my favourite pill songs, I must say. So, mm. yes, tell me South tell African us about interrogation that. techniques came to my mind. Uh, and uh, I wanted to study that, and the more I, I went into it, the more appalled and disgusted I was with brutality of any kind inflicted upon anybody. And so I used that really as the backdrop to the song, but then expanded it into all areas. So it's, it's, a, it's open. The wings are flapping inside it, but it's open to all agendas. Sometimes songs can do that. It's, 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 it's ironical. You can say one thing and mean another. Your fans are devoted, and, and I was never they? a great fan of Nelson Mandela mm. because I, I was aware of like you know some of the, the cruelties that you know were, were clear reasons why he was put away in the first place. What do you mean? Well, there were some the pretty tire, unpleasant the tire, things. Yeah. Yeah. Tires yeah, around the tire, necks, tire, tire, uh, tires around people's necks. Yeah, there was filled a... with gasoline and set alight, and I mean his followers were like you know rather partial to that kind of stuff and. And of course, Winnie Mandela 
running an alleged football team, which was really we just serious psychos. Right? Clear this of is that, stuff. But it was so some members of the ANC were were involved in a pretty unpleasant practice. Can I ask you, John, about your fans? from Public Image Limited, because you say sometimes that you look out into the crowd and you see them particularly, for example, during Rise, and they they get it. They're, yeah, they're yeah, crying, yeah. they're singing it back to you. Yeah, I, I, it was, you know, I'm very nearsighted if they were too close. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is an amazing thing. When I first started performing live, I mean, I'd be a bit, you know, you wouldn't want to catch people's eyes. And so I suppose they, the, 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 the Leiden or the Rotten Stare was really, you know, trying to, to meet that but then realize that people are trying to tell me something and now they're, they're not trying to tell me they're just being themselves and that's what i'm reading that that is the most excellent form of communication i think goes beyond music and ultimately if you enjoy what what it is i do being in the music industry it really is about being beyond music and it's that special moment where you're both clued in to something very similar that's happened to you a, a painful experience. It, it's spiritual, yes. yes. It's the perfect church, right? Huh? Without the stupidity of a godlike figure. Some would disagree with that point, but what, you, you have a gig coming up in December. Oh, you're, you're a bibble basher. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying that <laughs> many people who are listening who, who disagree with you on, Absolutely. on that point. Absolutely, and, and they're more than welcome to that. This is my point of view. You have a gig coming the up The church in I adhere to has no godlike figure. It's open for all of us and we're all equal. Is music still as important to you as it was? You talked about the sort of spiritual experience of music. What, what's mm. the, this, this gig coming up at the O2 in, in December? Yeah. How often are you gigging and how much enjoyment do you still get from we that? Live, we live to perform. We make records to perform. Yeah. And once we're performing, we make the money then to make records so we can perform again. It's, um, it's how we are. I mean, we're, we're about to now go into, as public image, uh, into a, some serious recording session time. But in between, we like to break that up with live performance. And that's very, very important because it reminds you of what it is you're doing this for. Rather than getting to knob twiddling and showing off your big bag e ego in, in a recording studio, you have to know that you have to perform these things live and you can't use trickery. So it, it keeps you in tune with you, what is vital and essential humanity is it true that you don't like saying uh who you enjoy listening to currently because it's so impossibly large a list um uh, and if i give you a list right now i guarantee in 30 seconds the first thing i hear out there will alter that list so, but, <laughs> do, you, do you know what i mean but so do you not want people, people are... to know that you like them music no i love everything but okay. believe me she's uh, <laughs> extremely open-minded the term used to be catholic taste but I don't, I don't like the religious connotation <laughs> what have you got against catholicism <laughs> the fact that you probably were brought up one were you as it i love everything i really do <laughs> I, I i totally appreciate the energy and the anxiety and the pain you have to go through to 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 put a record together to write the thing to rehearse it, to record it, and then and then release it, and know that on that release date, some sarcastic, evil-minded journalist is going to mm. tear your heart and soul out of you and imply all manner of stupidities upon you. And that's unfair, and that's wrong. It takes a lot to be loud and proud. Put your head in the block. Don't let them drop the blade. Lots of people are enjoying listening to you. I'm going to try and squeeze in a few questions before we have to let you go at three. Martin says he's driven past three service stations listening to this interview now. He says he's got the bladder the size of a football, but it is worth it. Can you... <laughs> Fair play to you, Martin. I hope you're still there, Martin. Well, they should pipe the BBC into toilets. <laughs> uh, he wants to ask, uh, how do you think you are viewed now? His question mark is national treasure, eccentric. What do you think? I don't know. The national treasure one was odd, wasn't it? Yeah. And there was another one where, uh, oh, maybe that was the list where I was put somewhere in between uh, Nelson and Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> nice place what, to be. I thought, what a fine pair of bookends. <laughs> <laughs> another one which has been... But I don't, look, I'm not precious about this and I don't want no don't accolades okay. or, or, or any of that. It, it doesn't matter. I, I do what I do and I carry on doing it. A, a couple of people have asked, I know you've been asked this as well in the last few days, about the anti-establishment how does that sit with not living in the uk now and also that the butter making ads for butter 
I'm not anti-establishment. I'm just not very interested in contributing well, to it. People say that, that, that doesn't sit well with their image of you or who I you... I don't give tuppence for their imagery oh, of the, me. The image you that I yourself. care about the accuracy of myself. And I am true to my word forever. I cannot deal with newspaper headlines as being representative of me because they're consistently not and i've said so for years and years and years can i ask you a and different please way please pay attention folks yeah. why did you decide to make a butter advert oh the money was fantastic <laughs> okay, we go. and if you look at me i eat rather a lot of it <laughs> uh, last question <laughs> um d blundell on twitter would like to know your favorite song that you've ever written uh um i uh, i haven't written it yet no. Oh. Still to come. No, no, seriously, I'm in search of it. Th when that will come, maybe, one day. I don't know, but... When you can know, we that, go and you, see you You're never satisfied. You can't be if you're creating things. When can we go and see you perform? Uh, Soon. December the 2nd. Well, I'll be at the hotel bar around midnight. <laughs> 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 we'll see you then. We'll be there. Yeah, the September, September the 10th at the O2... December. Brilliant. Thank Thanks you very much, so John Lydon. Great Lydon. to have you on Five Live. Next on Five Live. Clock. He's part of music history as the former frontman and lyricist of the Sex Pistols, but as Johnny Rotten gave way to John Lydon, how much has the man himself mellowed over the years? He's just released a document of his incredible life so far, which he describes as the life of a serious risk taker. John Lydon, author of Anger is an Enemy, My Life Uncensored. Welcome to Five Live, an afternoon edition. Hello. Hello, I'm best John. known by proper music lovers as the front man of Public Image Limited. I just thought I'd throw <laughs> that in. <laughs> uh, understandable. Of that. Um, we, we talked about the, the title of the book, Anger is an Energy. Are, are you still angry today? Are you as angry as you were? Do you still get angry at the same things? Well, if, if something's there to irritate the hell out of me and suppress me, of course I'm going to be angry. I'm never going to resort to violence. I'm going to use the energy therein. Describe how now, that anger works. anger is an energy. Let me explain what that that, that phrase comes from. Because some people say that anger, from. anger saps you of energy. No. And try not to interrupt and we'll get somewhere. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll have a lot quicker. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is three of us, though, John. It will an example of anger <laughs> and energy. <laughs> no, it is, uh, when I was young, I had a serious disease, which has uh, almost took my life, called meningitis. And... Uh, the result of that was a year in hospital, but uh, when I came out of the coma, I lost my memory. Uh, I didn't remember anybody or anything. Including your parents? Including my parents, and, and even more so, my own name. Uh, I couldn't speak properly. I was deeply frustrated. I couldn't communicate with anyone, but I didn't recognise anybody. And uh, years later, my mum and dad, they told me... Uh, that the hospital recommended me, took me home at eight. Uh, it was going to be difficult to deal with me, but to keep me angry. And, and that would somehow help me much, much harder. I know it seems harsh, but mm. it did. It helped me remember. It How took four years, e everything, all the details properly. They, they do return. Yeah. You know, they are stored up there. They don't yeah. just vanish. How did your parents keep you angry? Uh, not giving in to whims or tantrums, uh, uh, not mollycoddling me, and uh, absolutely uh, uh, making it clear that self-pity wouldn't work. And that helped me not become a, an institutionalised dummy dum dum. Even though when I went back to... And uh, I managed to get that all back, and then tenfold. I mean, you know, I'm well self-educated, me. Mm. Uh, libraries, absolutely essential part of, of that, that learning process. And so kind of w well crafted, really, and mentally prepared for something as daft as the Sex Pistols. Because I think when, when people meet you for the first time, they have, a, they have an idea of, of what you will be like. And yeah. I, I wonder whether in writing this book, are you trying to paint a picture of, of, of the truth or are you... Oh yeah, no, yeah. it's not paint yet. No, I, I want you to completely clearly understand what it is I came from that made me what I am and what I'm going to continue to be. It's, um, it's unfortunate that, you know, when you, you join a, a pop band and it, it achieves some sense of fame, that people tend to categorise you as never existing before that day they first heard about you. 
And where, how did you make that move then from angry teenager who, who as you described, been, been through that, that coma very early in life into the Sex Pistols? What was the, what was yeah, the, what was the I, mental I know, move? I know you, you, you're implying that I just walk around angry all the no, time. No, no. I'm very no, well, far from that. I'm, just, I'm trying <laughs> to get into why, you know, I, I know obviously it's, it's the lyrics to, to one of your songs, Anger is, is an Energy, but, you know, you talk about yourself in the book. On the back back page, it talks about you quite clearly as a as a risk taker. Mm. And I just wondered that 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 whole anger element. If you were to ask somebody who watched you in the seventies, saw your music, saw the way that you acted, they would say that that, that is a big part of of who you are. So I'm just trying to find. Oh, it's out. definitely a, yeah. yeah. So I'm trying it's to a see. Very interesting side of me, but how did you get from teenager to to Sex Pistols man? Uh, with great difficulty and many jobs have been thrown out of schools and uh, I then worked on building sites to raise the money conti to continue my education. Uh, I love learning, I love observing, etc, uh, etc. Et uh, the more words I have in my vocabulary, the better I will be as a human being, I think. And, and I could never ever like a... Uh, lose the energy to want to absorb. I'm a bit like a sponge, you know, like a, a very a two-year-old, how they want to just take everything in. What's that? What's that, right? Tell that kid what that is, right? And it's the same with poor old Johnny here. What's school? That's what even the teachers called me. But then as a result of that, though, were you sort of always on the periphery of, of things a little bit? Well, you feel kind of isolated. It's very hard to fit back in, and you don't recognise anyone in, 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 in the school. Or, and you, you, just, it's a mystery, you know, and you, de you depend really heavily on um, the word that people tell you to be the whole truth and nothing but. If they tell you you belong here, you have to believe that. Um, of course, I mean, there were many lies told to me, and I've never forgot them adults. But I guess you know, you, and this is why to this day I, I, I do not tolerate people lying to me. I, I, guess I count very, very heavily on the truth. I'm interested in, the, in whether or not your childhood and having meningitis and being in the coma and the way it was for you at school, is that actually what's, what's made you really angry because you feel like an outsider? No, but it definitely fuels some energy there. Um, it took a long time for me to... Uh, Get back to where I was. I mean, at four... Do you like people, can I just ask yeah, you? Yeah, oh, very much. I'm very social. <laughs> but at, at four... As long as they don't interrupt you. At four years old, <laughs> I could read and write. 